Isaiah 7, verses 1 through 17. And the days of Ahaz, the son of John, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the king of Amalia, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount attack against, mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook, as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go to meet Ahaz, you and your and Shear Joshua, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool, on the highway to the washer's field. And say to him, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands, at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramali. Because in Syria, but Ephraim and the son of Ramalia, he has advised against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah, and terrify it, let us conquer it for ourselves, and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, It shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within sixty-five years, Ephraim shall be shattered from being a people, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, of Samaria, the son of Amalia. If you are not firm in your faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, the Lord said, spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name in pain. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house of such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for the opportunity to hear from your word. So God, I ask that your word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, would pierce our hearts, God. God, if there's a sin that we need to be convicted of, would it work in us to convict us of sin? Bring us to repentance. Would it encourage us? Would it strengthen us? God, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Who do you trust? Who do you trust? I don't simply mean a person who you know you can keep confidence with and you need to tell them a secret. But who do you trust to tell you the truth? And second to that, who do you trust to be true to their word? Right, in 2013, Reader's Digest is like to a poll and ask Americans, who do you trust the most? Who's the most trusted person in America? They found that for most people, like 70% and above, most people trusted their doctor, their spiritual advisor, and their child school teacher. But among public figures, the person, I want you to guess for a second, just to yourself, who do you think the person was who was the most trusted in America in 2013? It's Pelosi. <laughs> A lot of people, yeah, there could be a lot of people, not a politician, I'll tell you that. Uh, it was actually Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump himself. Oh. <laughs> and what I think is interesting about this is that, you know, Tom Hanks, he's trustworthy. He's probably why he got to play Mr. Rogers, you know, in the most recent movie that came out. But I think it's interesting because, you know, even though he's been in many iconic movies from decade to decade, and we can probably identify with some of those movies, it's probably true that. He has never said a word that you've heard that he hasn't been paid to say. I don't mean to say that he's trying to con you, but in all that he's done, he's worth half a billion dollars himself. He probably has been paid for every word that, that you've heard him say. So it makes me wonder, right? I'm not trying to get you to doubt Tom Hanks, but it does make you wonder what makes somebody trustworthy? What are the characteristics that make him trustworthy? Well, I think the first thing is that they have to be unafraid to tell you the truth. 
Right? Someone who refuses to tell you the truth is deceiving you by their silence. Right? Person, uh, the person, the, the, sorry. Uh, and the, the truth of this trustworthy per person tells you needs to hold up. Right? It's, it's really common to say that they are lying, whoever they is. Right? If you, if you hear things, well, they are lying. But if you just replace one lie with another lie, then it doesn't matter. Right? I mean, someone needs to tell you the truth, and that truth needs to actually hold up. The second thing that makes someone trustworthy is that they have your best interest at heart. You know, more than a few sins have been committed by somebody saying, well, I'm just saying the truth. Right? They use that as an excuse to say whatever they want, regardless of how hurtful it might be. But rather, someone who you trust has your best interest at heart. Right? They have discernment to know whenever they speak to you, they need to speak in a certain way. It doesn't mean that they hold the truth back. But they know that if someone is flying high and caught up in their pride, then they probably need to be cut down. But someone else who's timid and meek and who needs a word of encouragement, they need to hear that word in a different way, in a gentler way. So they tell you the truth, they have your best interest in heart, and third, someone who's trustworthy is there when you need them. Now, it's not simply a matter of saying that they'll be there, but it's their presence. So they might tell you, if they give you their word, they're going to keep it. But then you also know this is a person you can call at midnight on a Saturday, and if you need them, they'll show up. So a person is trustworthy if they speak the truth, if they have your best interest at heart, and if they are reliable. We see that the person's trustworthiness is found not just in their word, but also in their actions. And so therefore, the type of disloyalty that hurts the most is whenever it's someone who we trust the most. Right in 2015, there was a scandal. Volkswagen, who is a pretty trusted car company, had a very loyal customer base. The cars were normally known to be reliable, fuel efficient. But it came out they had been cheating the system. Right, whenever they had to do emissions testing, they had their engineers had programmed to lie to the emissions test and make it through. And this rocked their company. They had to recall thousands and thousands of vehicles. If you look up online, you can find Volkswagen graveyard down in the desert where they. They just had to take these vehicles back and put them somewhere. And it was because the reason I heard so many people was because they were a company that were trusted by so many people. We can list other examples. And I think in our current age of distrust, we really need to focus on who do we trust and why. We need somebody to trust. And today I hope in our text in Isaiah chapter 7 that we read just a moment ago, in Matthew chapter 1 that we read earlier in the service, and this we see that God is someone we can trust. More specifically, we see that God proves to his people that he is dependable and worthy of their trust by giving short and long-term promises, which he then fulfills. I'm going to say that again. God proves to his people that he is dependable and worthy of their trust by giving short and long-term promises, which he then fulfills. Well, as we begin in our text today in Isaiah, there's been a transition of power. And it's kind of similar to what you might, you might expect in England in the next couple of years. We don't know when, but Queen Elizabeth has been the Queen of England for 67 years. And you, you, you just feel bad for who's ever going to come after her, you know. Uh, she's done such a good job. I mean, whoever, whether it's Charles or William or, you know, whoever, it's going to be tough. But imagine inheriting the throne after someone who's had it for a long time in the middle of a war. And that would be all the more difficult. Well, that's kind of where Ahaz finds himself today. His grandfather reigned for 52 years. His father reigned for 16 years. And now he's a 21-year-old man in the middle of a national crisis. We spoke about this some last week. About two nations, Syria, the king of Syria is Rezin, the capital of Syria is Damascus, and the other nation is Israel to the north. The king of Israel is Pekah, the son of Romalia. They're attacking Judah and Jerusalem to force Ahaz to join their team. Right? Assyria is a new big hill on the block, and they want Judah's help, but Ahaz won't give it. And so they band against him, and it says, we're told in verse 3, rather verse 2, that the heart of Ahaz and the heart of the people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. He's terrified. And frankly, if you were in his position, you probably would be too, because between a rock and a hard place. And it's in the midst of this chaos that God sends Isaiah with his son, Shear Joshu. You think that's kind of a weird name. Uh, his other son's name is Meher Shalal Hashmaz, so you know, 
and she has her shoes on pretty nice. Uh, he takes his son to see the king. Ahaz is at the conduit of the upper pool. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem, one of the things you need to know is it's on a mountain, but it's kind of only on a mountain on three sides, uh, which makes it a good position for defense. Uh, it's got the uphill advantage on all but the back side of it, and it has access to water. And so Ahaz, what he's doing is he knows the invasion's coming. He wants to make sure if they're in the seas, they have a good, secure water source. And Isaiah goes up to him, and he tells him this word from God. In verse 4, it says this, Be careful. Be quiet. Don't fear. And don't let your heart be faint, because these two smoldering stumps of firebrands, at the fierce anger of resident in Syria, and the son of Ramalia. Right? Just because you're threatened, just because these two kings want to come, they want to replace you on the throne and put their guy in your place. Don't fear. And in verses 7 through 9, God gives this pronouncement. Thus says the Lord, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. The head of Syria is Damascus, that's the capital. The head of Damascus is Rezim, that's the king. And within 65 years, Ephraim, Ephraim is one of the, it's one of the t- uh, ten tribes and that made up the kingdom of Israel, and it was the largest one at the time. So in Ephraim, shall be shattered for being an evil. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, that's the capital, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramalia. If you are not firm in your faith, you will not be firm at all. God is reminding me, you might wonder, why is, he, why is he talking like this? He's reminding Ahaz about the ultimate weakness of his enemies. Right? The head of the nation of Syria is its capital, the head of the capital is the king, and that's as high as it gets. The head of the Ephraim is their capital, the head of the capital is their king, and that's as high as it gets. But Ahaz, Ahaz, who is the head of you? Who's your head? Well, if we've read the Bible, we know two things. First off, Ahaz is of the family of David. And God has made a promise to David that his throne will continue forever. But the second thing is this. The head of Ahaz is God. God is the God of Judah. And so Ahaz need not fear, because God is on his side. Now this should be, and he also tells him that within 65 years of Ephraim, your enemy in this war, they're not even going to be a people anymore. They're going to be shattered. Now you might think that this would be a confidence-boosting word. Right? God tells Ahaz and other nations, they can't, they're, they're going to stop. They're not going to go on forever. And I think it's important, you might wonder, well, why is Isaiah's son on the way? Why is Sheer Jashub there with him? Well, in Hebrew, the word Sheer Jashub means this, a remnant shall return. A remnant shall return. And so it's a word for Ahaz, and all the things are going to get bad, they already are bad. At the end of this circumstance, there still are going to be a people in Judah. There may be fewer. They may be weaker, but there will be a people. The other two nations won't even exist anymore, but you will continue. And he finishes this way, and I think it's interesting, in, in verse 9, he says, If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. The Hebrew verb here, for, for, for being firm in faith, is amen. You might be familiar with that word. What it means is to trust someone, to be firmly established. And so the Hebrew is actually saying, if you do not amen, you will not be amen. You might be like, Brian, what does that mean? I think he's saying this, if you do not trust God, if you do not believe God, if you're not firm in your faith in God, then God is not going to, or sorry, then you will not be firm. You will not stand firm if you do not believe. And so the word for Ahaz is this, that he needs to trust God. He doesn't need to fear, but he needs to believe that God will carry the nation through the crisis. He has to have the faith to stand. And this makes us contemplate God's word and his trustworthiness. Right? God is a trustworthy God. He keeps his word. Not one of the promises that he has made has failed to come to pass. And Ahaz needs to count on that. This is why we believe God's word. This is why we trust him. God guides our decisions. Well, second, in addition to having a faith to stand, God gives Ahaz a reassuring sign. A reassuring sign. Isaiah doesn't tell us in chapter 7 how Ahaz responded to that first promise, but if we read in 2 Kings chapter 15 and 16, we get another account of this. 
We know that Ahaz's first impulse whenever he's facing a crisis, it's not to stop and pray. It's not to fast. It's not to seek the word from the prophet. Sometimes that's not our first response either, though. But rather, what Ahaz decides to do is he's going to consult all the other gods of all the other nations that surround him. Again, he kind of cast his lot, and hopefully one of them will carry through. And so God does something that he normally doesn't do, but he wants Ahaz to trust him. And so in verse 11, he sends Isaiah to Ahaz, and he says this, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol, as low as the grave, and let it be as high as heaven. So we need to ask, what is a sign? Whenever we see about signs in the Bible, whenever we read about them, what is a sign? Well, I would say, simply put, a sign is an outward confirmation from God that his word will come true. A sign is an outward confirmation from God that his word will come true. Right in the Bible, one one example of a sign is the ten plagues that afflict Egypt. These are plagues that God is sending upon the nation of Egypt. To confirm to Israel and to Egypt that God will deliver his people from Pharaoh. Oftentimes, God's people ask for signs to confirm his word. Gideon is one. If you've read the book of Judges, you know Gideon asked for signs. Except this doesn't really reflect well on Gideon. You see, Gideon is a man that the people of Israel are at war. And Gideon is hiding in his wife and his father's wine press. And so God comes to him and he says, Gideon, I want you to command the army. And what Gideon forces God to do, he says, if you show me a sign, then I'll do it. It's almost like he's trying to make a bargain with God. God, I'll do the hard thing you're calling me to if you show me a sign. It reflects poorly on Gideon's faith. In the Gospels, the Pharisees ask Jesus for a sign. In Matthew 12, they come to him and they say, you know, show us a sign. Right? But what does Jesus say? I'm not going to give any sign to this generation. If you've not paid attention to the miracles I've been performing, you're not going to pay attention to another sign that I We want to ask God for a sign, but I think whenever we do this, we risk something. We risk turning God into a genie in a bottle. Again, God, if you just do this thing for me, then I'll do something for you. And this is where, whenever we think about God's interaction with Ahaz, God is being gracious to him. Because God is actually telling Ahaz, look, I want you to ask me for a sign. I know what you're going through is tough. It's difficult. So ask me. I'm giving you a blank check. Tell me what you want, and I will prove it to you. But what is Ahaz's response? Look at verse 13, or verse 12. He refuses to ask for a sign, and it's under the auspice of not wanting to put God to the test. And this is a false piety. If God, if Ahaz really believed God, then he would have obeyed him. He would have given a sign, or he would have asked for a sign, because that's what God commanded him to do. And so Isaiah responds in verse 13, Listen, O house of David. It's not just Ahaz, it's actually his whole government administration who are making this decision. Listen, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you would weary my God also? Are you just going to wear us out and again and again and again deny God? By rejecting God's sign, by rejecting his commands, they are rejecting God himself. But that does not deter God. And so in verses 14 to 17, he says that he's going to give Ahaz a sign anyway, and it's this. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey, and when he knows how to refuse evil, he'll choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse evil and choose the good, the land which the two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring it upon you, and upon your people, and upon your father's house, in such days as have not come since the days that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. God is going to bring forth the son. How do you know that God is going to be faithful to his word? He's going to bring forth a boy behind a virgin who's never known a man. And the name of this son is going to be Emmanuel, which means God with us. You don't think that God's with you in the midst of the trial. His very name is Emmanuel, God with us. Right? Before the child is old enough to even make a moral decision, the people who are afflicting you today will not be a people anymore. They're not going to afflict you anymore. That's a long-term promise. And it's meant to ground Isaiah's, sorry, Ahaz's trust in the present. And in addition to this, God actually tells Ahaz, you're going to get what you want. 
Right? One of the alternatives for Ahaz was rather than team up with Israel and Syria, he could just call Assyria and say, hey, listen, guys, I'll be on your team. I'll give you a lot of money. Right? I'll, I'll give to you from the temple. I'll give to you from the treasury if you give me defense. And so God tells Ahaz, okay, if you want to do that, you'll get Assyria. He's going to come. And it's going to be like nothing you've ever seen before. Namely, it's going to be terrible. If you keep on reading in verses 18 to 25, the Assyrians are going to come and they're going to take everything. Right? The food, the, the land that used to be good for uh, livestock and for raising crops. And you're not going to have that anymore. Right? We used to yield a thousand you know, bushels of wheat. It's only going to yield ten. Right? You think that you know, you're still going to have a cow, you're still going to have a goat, but the only food you're going to be able to eat is the curds that come from their milk because you won't actually be able to farm anymore. Ahaz's lack of faith results in judgment against him. God will be faithful. Don't, be, don't, don't get me wrong. God will be faithful to the people. And he'll still be faithful to the line of David. Thankfully, Ahaz's son Hezekiah is a lot better and does trust the Lord. But where Ahaz demonstrates his faithlessness, God proves his trustworthiness. Right. Remember this line from verse 9. If you do not believe, if you do not trust, if you are not made, if you do not, if you're not firm in your faith, you will not be made firm. This happens to Ahaz. But nevertheless, so does the other promises that God made. Within 65 years, Ephraim ceased to be a nation. God took them into exile in 722 BC, whenever the nation of Syria invaded them and dismantled them as a nation. And this would be the sign a continued sign that God would be with the people. And this is a sign that carried on for the next 730 years until the word we read earlier in Matthew 1 took place. And this is the final thing I want us to see today. That there is an unsettling, an unexpected, an unsettling fulfillment of God's promise in Matthew 1. Right, what happens? There's a young woman. Her name's Mary. And all we're told is that she has conceived a son by the Holy Spirit. And she's engaged, she's betrothed to a man named Joseph. And I may have explained this before, but betrothal was a little bit, it was a little tighter than our engagement, but not quite as strong as marriage. All the agreements had been worked out between the families. It was just a matter of time to plan the ceremony and to let the groom get all of his affairs in order before he married. But in order to be, in order to break off that engagement, in order to break off that betrothal, you actually had to get a certificate of divorce. So Joseph is engaged to his young wife, and he finds out that she's pregnant. And just like we would do if we were in the same circumstance, we, he assumes that something awry has happened, right? That Mary has been unfaithful, and that the child is a result of her unfaithfulness. He can put two and two together. We're told that Joseph is a just man. He's righteous. So he resolves to put her, to divorce her quietly. He's not going to put her to a open court. He's not going to shame her. He's a righteous man. Again, this seems like a rational decision. Maybe you would have made the same decision in that circumstance. But God is in this story. God is in this story. We know something that Joseph didn't know at the time, which is that Mary did not conceive Jesus Christ with another man, but that the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus in her womb. And God wants to give Joseph a sign to want to give him peace. And so, Joseph, while he's sleeping, an angel comes to him in a dream. God speaks to him. And in verse 20, Matthew 1, verse 20, it says this, God's, Joseph, son of David, do not fear, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet 700 years earlier. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Just like Ahaz, God commands Joseph not to fear. Don't fear that you're going to be raising a son that's not your own. Don't fear what others are going to say when they see that your fiancé is pregnant. Don't fear what's going to happen to your soon-to-be wife, because God is in this. In fact, the child in the womb of your fiancé 
is the fulfillment of the Word of God. God will enter into the human plight. God will rescue his people in the person of Jesus Christ. Joseph has to decide, is this God worth trusting? Is his word as good as he says it is? But he, Joseph does. In verse 24, it says, Joseph woke from his sleep. He did as the angel of God commanded him. And he took his wife, but did not know her until she'd given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. It's interesting. It's not that Mary called him Jesus, but that Joseph called him Jesus. Joseph took in this boy into his family. He was his earthly adopted father. And Jesus indeed would save his people from their sins. He overcame the temptation of Satan in the desert. Through the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out, God, not my will, but yours be done. And he ultimately died on the cross for our sins. He was the sacrificial lamb that absorbed the wrath of God so that we wouldn't have to for all who believe in him. And this is why we know that God is dependable. Remember, God proves to his people that he is dependable and worthy of their trust by giving short and long-term promises which he then fulfills. Brother and sister, God is trustworthy. I don't know what you're going through today. Again, I don't know what your fears are, but I want to give you a word that God is trustworthy. If he's, given, if he's given you a promise, then you can take that to the bank. He acts in ways that we don't expect all the time. But he is trustworthy. It comes down to who we are going to trust. We're going to trust somebody. Who is he going to be? Right, 30 years ago, I mentioned that Tom Hanks used to be the most trusted, well, you know, he still may be, the most trusted man in America. But if we'd taken that poll 30 years ago, the person who was the most trusted man in America was Walter Cronkite. Maybe many of you watched the news coverage on the CBS Evening News. Right, they saw Walter report on the JFK assassination, the Civil Rights Movement, the Vietnam War. And they were used to his sign-off at the end of every broadcast, and that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Well, as helpful as Walter Cronkite may have been, he's ultimately not the most trustworthy person. Right? One thing that one strike against him is that Walter's dead right now. Right? He can't show up in the middle of the night to help you. Also, Walter was not, he reported to us a lot of things, but he wasn't omniscient. He didn't know everything. He wasn't omnipresent. He wasn't everywhere at the same time. He wasn't omnipotent. He wasn't the one who had all power. But God is. God is. And we can come to him in faith. So my question for you today is, do you believe do you trust? Again, you might go home this afternoon, turn on the TV, and somebody is going to tell you that you need to be afraid. Someone's going to tell you that you need to be worried right now. Doesn't matter what your political stripe is. Doesn't matter your age. Someone's going to tell you, you need to be afraid. And my question for each and every one of us today is, are you going to trust God? Are you going to trust God? If you haven't ever trusted him before by faith, I'm going to be standing down front in just a minute, and I would invite you to come. I'd love to pray with anybody who wants to talk about what it means to trust God, to repent of our sins, and to follow Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. If you would, please bow your heads with me, and let's go before the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a trustworthy, dependable God. God, we, as we consider our own lives, we know that as dependable as we want to be, as true to our word as we want to be, we're not going to succeed 100% of the time. God, we are finite, limited human beings, and there are going to be moments in our life where we fail. And God, if each and every one of us have experienced a moment in our life where somebody has failed us, but God, you have not failed us. <clears throat> That doesn't mean that everything is easy all the time. That doesn't mean that we will never suffer. But God, all your promises are true. You've sent us your Holy Spirit as a seal of our inheritance. And so God, would you help us to trust this? Would you help us to trust that there is nothing that we can do? There's no sin that we can commit. There's no wrong, ill deed that we can perform that would take away your love for us. And it doesn't matter what we've done in the past, but we know that your love covers a multitude of sins. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to trust that fact. 
Would you help us to trust, trust you that you are our creator and redeemer? We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.